Welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. I'm Rich Mellon of Trapping Inc. TV. And I'm Sandy Mellon. And uh, this uh, version, episode, whatever we call it, of our podcast is brought to you from the living room of our home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we usually do it uh, down in the basement where we have a bunch of our taxidermy. And we have a bunch up here as well. Or at but- the cabin. Or, or at the cabin, but yeah. you see, it's cold outside. It's, uh, I don't know, about zero Fahrenheit, minus 20 uh, uh, Celsius, and I, we heat our house with geothermal. The floor, the slab downstairs is, it has uh, hydronic heating, and it. it's very nice to walk on. I find it very comfortable, but you know the queen of fire. This is where the fireplace is. <laughs> so and this got, is where I'm very comfortable. So, so. She's, she's got to sit in front of the fireplace. And, and old Rich, he's starting to sweat. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that is, is really neat, the news that we want to tell you is, God bless you folks, but the, the podcast has really taken off. Yeah, all of a sudden, it's really jumped. And I, I think a lot of it is has got to do with now it's trapping season and people are, are looking for, for things that they can listen to or, and or watch. I think part of it, though, is, is uh, our airing on the Pursuit Channel in the United States. Ah, uh, yes. Because we do have a, one of our, our billboards talks about coming to, uh, it talks about the Scuttlebutt pod, podcast and it talks about coming to our website and, and where you can connect with everything. And I think that's maybe the jump we're seeing. But uh, in Canada... We hit, we busted the top 40 on the charts oh, in yeah. Canada. That's pretty cool. That's very cool. For us, it's very cool. And in the U.S., uh, we have uh, mm. peaked at 105. We've hit, we hit as high, high as 105. And, and that's with us being very, very poor uh, work ethic recently because we've been so busy <laughs> doing everything else. And <laughs> I'm and we've gone, had you're l- gone. <laughs> lots of people asking are you guys not doing podcasts anymore? And it isn't that at all. It's just, here's, it's the busyness of the season. Here's the right? worst part. The absolute worst part. And this would have started more rumors today. That I actually thought, because you're on the road, I'm on the road. I actually thought about doing this by Skype. But then oh. I thought, what would that say to our <laughs> folks out there if, if we had to do a Skype podcast with our, with our spouses? <laughs> Well, and next week I'm on the road for work, and the week after I'm on the road for um, a provincial board that I sit on. So, yeah, it was either today or probably no day for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, or do it by Skype. Yeah. Or do it by Skype, and we just thought, nah, it's probably not a good idea. Today's podcast, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, traffic season that started for us, and I, I want to get around and talk about NAFA. Uh, oh, yes. and, and what has happened in, in selling our furs for, for uh, to the fur market. And um, all good conversations. Um, got a lot, lots I want to talk about. Of course, when don't I have lots to talk about? Mm. <laughs> Muskrat season this year actually uh, started out pretty good. It did. Un- unbelievably, though, we, we've had so much water here. And it has rained and rained and rained and never quit raining. And... Yeah, I know. I'm right beside your bed, aren't I? Yeah, okay, we'll lay on it. <laughs> and uh, we ended up, usually when you go into fall, the rain stops. And when the rain stops, then water starts to drop off. That surplus drops off, and you kind of hit that, that level that, that it will spend the winter at. But it didn't happen this year. It stayed really, really high. And I don't know, I didn't, uh, I didn't know what that was going to cause but it caused some really unique situations yeah it sure did <laughs> for one thing you know the years when they when the everybody thinks there are so many muskrats because they build those uh cattail colonies everywhere well that's actually this year and yeah there is lots of muskrats but no more than any other year yeah and i think it's just got to do with with, with because the water's so high well the water is very high and it made made our little just over here from our house it made it it made it very difficult to get around. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. But I think what the problem was is that when the water is at that lower level, I think you have a lot more muskrats that live in the bank. And then when the water becomes so high, well, now, you know, it keeps going up. It's easier for them to build a colony than, than, than to dig another another bank. Probably. And I could be 100% wrong on that. If, if somebody out there has a PhD in muskratology, tell me. <laughs> but this year, we even had 
colonies built in the puddle in our backyard. We have a, a dugout in our backyard uh, where we or burrow pit, if you want to call it, because we needed dirt to bury the house. And, mm-hmm. and this year, for the first time ever, we have colonies built in there. And we always have a few muskrats in, in, in it, and I trap it every year. And the same thing over in all these other little bodies of water. But there are just colonies everywhere. And I think it's because it, that uh, the, the water level is so high that they're just not being able, able to access that uh, those banks, right? Yeah. Well, the Could- water... The, the water level actually has the water in behind the cattails. Usually the cattails end at about three, four feet of water, and it goes straight down to the bottom around here, and then the cattails grow right up onto dry land. They really right. just need mud, basically. Mm-hmm. But this year, now, there's lots of water in, in behind the cattails, and maybe it's maybe it's in, they're not comfortable with, with, with the lack of security. I, I'm not don't sure what it is, but the only difference between this year and the last couple of years is that incredibly high water. Yeah, very high water. And um, everywhere we're seeing more muskrat push-ups. Yeah. Where we we haven't seen those for probably the last three years. Yeah. And what the muskrat push-up is, it's when they build that clump of, of weeds up on top of the ice. And they build it as the ice is forming. What that is, is and it's away from shore. They don't live in there. That's his breath of air. Yeah. Okay, so he swims from shore out yeah. and he'll be going down. That's where his patch of coontail or or whichever weed it is whatever that he's, vegetation yeah, it is that he's or she is eating that he's eating and and he will he will go down and he will get that and he and he, he's got to come back up and and eat it and so he'll eat it inside that uh, that little hut out there that little Dome, weed hut yeah more or less we call them push-ups and they're a great place to trap we can yeah. trap them there anyway some places i understand it's not, it's against the law to to target the push-up but that is his breath of air, and that's where it's so hard when you have uh, mink, especially, or coyotes. Yeah. They come across the lake, and they will dig out every one of those push-ups. I don't know how successful coyotes are at catching a muskrat in that situation, unless they're like a polar bear, and they dig it out, and they sit there and wait till one pops up. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I did see, um, there's another pond that I drive by all the time when I'm on my way to work, and there it looks like coyote tracks or maybe a fox or something but more likely a coyote that has gone out on that one pond that yeah. where we turn the corner yeah and they've been at that one push up because you can see very clearly in the snow and we've had a little bit of fresh snow yeah I, so i i but i know with the mink they'll be getting under uh, under uh, the ice and mink do target muskrat a lot yeah you know so that but the problem with either one of the coyote or the or the mink digging out that push up is in then out freezes because yeah. it needs that, it needs that those weeds over top, and it needs that muskrat coming in and out and to keep the to keep the um, ice, uh, you know, from forming across that hole. And then all of a sudden, the muskrats are are bound into you know a much more restricted area that they can go. It's kind of a unique little situation they've got. But uh, we have out on the big trap line, we notice that when the mink come through, you know, you don't have a lot of muskrat out there. And you'll have a little pond. You'll notice one year there's a push-up. And then the next year there's there's nine push-ups. And the year after that, there's 18. And then usually a mink comes through. And then the next year Cleans there's no push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next year there's no push-ups. <laughs> and, and it starts all over again. It's the circle of life. Absolutely right? circle of life. I mean, mink, 60% of their diet here is muskrat. Yeah. You know, so they're, they're, they're pretty ferocious little little machines that way. One of the things, though, that the water problem that the water caused was because it was so high, a lot of these these big cattails, what you think is solidly anchored along the shore, all of a sudden floated. Yeah, and that made life very interesting while we were out. Um, on <laughs> we always call it our anniversary cruise. We usually don't start. Um, trapping muskrat until the first part of October and then and then we really like to finish the month off with weather permitting more muskrats because they they're even more prime at that point yeah yeah so these great huge mats of of cattail and I calling them a mat isn't really fair either until you understand what happens afterwards but they're like I say the, it, it's this whole rim around the ponds is solid cattails Probably for 40, 50 feet in some places, right? Yeah. Maybe more in some places. Yeah. But... Just depends how low the water is, like what kind of a slope there is and yeah. whatnot. And this year, with the, now all of a sudden, all of them are floating. It used to be that you could walk out right to the edge of the cattails because they were solid on bottom. Well, now they're floating. Yeah. And that so... That would have been a mistake this year. 
<laughs> you'd, have, you'd have fell through in a hurry. Not me. We have uh, on this one, <laughs> not you. <laughs> oh, I just missed that one. Was that a zing? <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. <laughs> or were you saying that, that you're, you're fitting into a, a, a smaller size <laughs> pair of pants? Sure, that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we have uh, one place that we go in, and there's this canal that the beavers have made over the years. They've been back and forth logging it, and so they cleaned out the uh, the yeah. cattail. So we call it the canal. You know, yeah. it's not like the Erie Canal or really. anything. Like that. <laughs> but uh, with with the uh, these cattails floating, then we get the big fall winds, right? Yes. And it starts blowing stuff around, and those cattails move up and down. Pretty soon, clumps of them. Some of them are you know, this big around and some of them are, are half the size of a house start drifting. Yeah. Well, we had a couple of them. I don't know. Well, we <laughs> <laughs> three, four, I guess, ended up in the canal. In the canal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Mr. Genius over here says, I'll throw the anchor on that. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> we will paddle and we'll drag it out of here. Ready, set, go. <laughs> so uh, I am paddling at the front of the canoe without eyes in the back of my head because I had a toucan. And and I am digging, digging, and it felt like I was going backwards. He goes, no, no, keep going. You're making, you're making progress. Okay, uh, well, two, two things here. Two points I want to make. First, uh, when we hit the end of the rope, we didn't go nowhere. And so I thought, well, I'll pull on the rope and that'll give some extra impetus. <laughs> and it did. And she was right. We were going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we actually got this, got, dislodged the, the particular clump. And, and as soon as the wind got it, well, it was gone. But second but, point. But second point. Okay. That exercise is part of the reason why the smaller set of pants. <laughs> I w- it was for your own good, honey. <laughs> Are you listening, ladies? <laughs> Gentlemen, I just say, don't go with that. <laughs> oh, come on. Life would be so boring without me around to, to upset the apple well, cart. Well, now that's true. That is true. We ended up, though, having a very un- it having a very unusual effect on our trapping. Because we always go out and we set with, uh, with the stakes and with yes. the, the Hags brackets uh, yeah. and uh, the Hags spring clips. Yeah. Well, when you've got these clumps of, of uh, cattails blowing around everywhere, they blow them over. They, they roll right over top of your stakes. And they knock them off on an angle. We lost some stakes and had yeah, to go back did. the next day. The wind would clear off. And, well, there's your stake laying sideways in the water. And We were lucky that we found a lot of them because um, those, those stakes are not easy. Like, if they, if they blow over, then they just sink because the trap is attached to them. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and if if it's leaning just on an angle, even you're not catching anything no, either. No, because the rat can't uh, doesn't have yeah. to for one thing. But more than likely, it, it's like a, a swim up diner for him to yeah. throw that carrot there. It's yeah, because right we have a little clip with a carrot on the top of it, and and the uh, whole idea behind those, if you've ever watched one of the shows with the hags brackets on it, is that they go to grab that carrot, and they step in the trap, and and she's all over. Don't quit talking because I'm going to drink coffee. Oh, Just keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for you to add more. Well, I was going to, and I, and I will. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's surprised. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we just knocking them out of, out of level can, can stop them from trapping. So we had to go back to, to our floats this year. Yes. And which is not preferable. And the, here's the reason is because uh, it's lots of extra paddling. And when, lots of weight. Well, and, yeah, because yeah. you keep up a canoe, even though we got a, yeah. an 18 foot canoe over there. Um, you know, you we have, I don't know how, how many, I didn't even want to count how many I've I got 25, 30, 30 uh, floats. Yeah. Two traps for float. That's a lot of weight. It is a lot of weight and it, and it's bulky as well. So, you know, we end up ta- making maybe more than one trip and that's where the hags brackets and, and oh. those, um, uh, what are what are the what spring clips? Of, yeah, but the stakes they're made out of fiberglass. fiberglass. Poles. Yeah, and so not very heavy, doesn't take up very much room, very easy to maneuver around and there's, whatnot. There's uh, that's how, how much room four dozen of them takes up. Yeah, exactly. Just like that, and yeah. you 
by five feet long, you throw them in the bottom and, and you know, they're really, really simple and they're, and they're, they're visual, easy to check and that just didn't work this year. It's well, a, but it's an unusual year. We no, haven't had unusual. water uh, like this in, uh, I'll bet you we had about 20 inches of rain more here. Than, more than, yeah. Um, and then, you know, everywhere in Northern Alberta seemed to be a lot of rain and it lasted it started raining before we left for Africa this year. Yeah. We were gone for a whole month, and there was more and more and more, and the farmers here are really suffering oh. because there is um, 50 to 60% of the canola yeah. uh, is still laying in swaths in the in the fields, and some of the um, Cereals. cereal crops yeah. are, are laying out as well. Thankfully, most of the farmers got their peas off. They usually come off early here. Yeah. And wheat and barley did come off and, and, you know, some people had to make changes to how they, how they harvested. It's just been a mess. Uh, lots of drying, grain drying going oh, on. Oh, yeah. It's been massive. And it's all over the place in probably central, northern, yeah. northern cent and, and more towards the middle of the province, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Because uh, we have friends and family um, around the Edmonton area that have been deeply affected by it as well. And it's not good in Saskatchewan either. No, no it's very, no, very we wet saw that a lot, as well. a lot, yeah. a lot still, uh, left out over there, that, which is too bad. And, you know, God bless the farmers. I hope it, I hope that, uh, at least with canola, they can take it off after, after yeah. the snow leaves and that, and, and they, it, they do lose grading, but at least they get it off. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're very fortunate as, as interesting and difficult as it has been, on the muskrat trapping side, it's nowhere near what some of our well, friends was, and family have experienced otherwise. <laughs> that was the last day I left them out one day too long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was at work. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm really whacking rats. I'm catching lots of rats and, and big, big rats. Big like, this year. What yeah. a year for big rats. Yeah. I don't know. I, it's got to do with, you know, she can have, uh, like, a female muskrat can have like four litters a year. Yeah. You know, and, and so I think sometimes you just hit it where, where there's been a whole crop of new ones and you get all those, I'm the king of the extra smalls. <laughs> you know? Sometimes we have had the extra smalls. Which are, sure. are just as much work as as a triple XL. But don't pay you quite as no, much. No, no. You, sometimes, I think the worst I ever did was like 83 cents for one. Oh, but but well. I have, you know, last year we did, I think we averaged five bucks Canadian, something like that for all of our rats. And this year supposed is looking like it's going to be better. Like, uh, the, the, uh, fur forecast look like rats are going to come back ag uh, again. So I'm banging some big, big rats and I leave it out one day too long. It was supposed to rain and I thought, okay, I can get, I can, you know, so you, rain I can deal with. Yeah. He says, yeah, we got six or eight inches of wet snow. <laughs> so what's that do? Well, the top of all of the water now there is this slush that's this thick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what it's like trying to paddle a canoe in that? I, I would guess it's kind of like dragging a clump, <laughs> a cl clump of no, cattails around the lake. That's good for you. That's good for you. <laughs> this was unbelievable work. And the, one of the things that you never think about is that canoe won't turn. You've got an 18-foot keel. That is sticking down there, and it's straight in the line, and that's when that's it's in the path. When it's in in a semi-solid like that, that that slush on top of the, <laughs> on top, <laughs> I can't get it to turn. Oh, I'm so glad I wasn't there. I, I might have murdered had, somebody. <laughs> I practically had to shovel out every time I wanted to turn around. You know, like it was it was like a three-point turnaround with a canoe. It was just hilarious. <laughs> so true. But we got it. Uh, we we got it done, and we had a we had a pretty good uh, muskrat uh, season. Uh, and we've got them all put up. They're all in, all in good shape. How many did we get? I don't know, hundred, two hundred. I don't. Oh, okay. Didn't bother counting yet. I count before I ship. I uh, ship, and I guess that's a really good seg segue into what's going on with NAFA. Yeah. So anyone who has sold fur or shipped fur. Um, through NAFA, well, there's two large auction houses. I'm sorry to interrupt. Two large auction houses. It's been NAFA, North American Fur uh, Auctions, Fur Auctions, and uh, Fur Harvesters (FHA). Okay, both were based out of Canada. NAFA was in in um, 
uh, Toronto was where was where their auction took place, and Fur Harvesters is in North Bay, Ontario. Now, continue. This they they they. <laughs> I was just throwing it back to you, Sam. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Those have been the two big auction houses, and NAFA was the largest. And actually, NAFA started as the Hudson Bay Company just mm-hmm. about 400 years ago. Yeah, Three. a long, long history. And and as anyone who took social studies in the in the years, well, maybe they don't teach this in social studies anymore. We have, we don't have children, haven't had children in, in elementary school for a long time. But <laughs> the... Um, the fur trade opened a lot of the West. And, and as we were talking here with a friend of ours not that long ago, a lot of the very first settlements or towns, if you like, were uh, trading posts that were opened in the North because of primarily the beaver trade. So anyway, that's the history that goes back with... Um, uh, Hudson with, Bay Company. Yeah, Hudson Bay uh, Company. And originally there was two of them, was Hudson Bay and James Bay. And uh, then they... Then they amalgamated, but 384 years that yeah. this has been going. And <clears throat> it's terrible to see this happen. Everybody says, well, you know, they asked me what I'm going to do or what's going on. And because and, I'm, I'm on the inside. Yeah, I'm on the inside. Yeah, we get, we get, we get special, <laughs> special treatment here. I think our fur check was the first one to bounce. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. And, and, you know, I mean, if there is a silver lining... Um, it wasn't much. We know people that had much larger oh, yeah. checks yeah. that uh, that were not honored. And there was a lot of talk from uh, NAFA that they were working with their bank and that they expected to have a solution and nobody panic and so on. And so nobody panicked. But at the end of the day, our 100 bucks is in the wind because NAFA did uh, end up being in receivership. Worse than that, though, we do have a bunch of Martin there that's, we, that we, are all select. We do. And they didn't, they, because of the, in the last auction, they didn't uh, get the, the, the reserve that they wanted on them. Uh, they didn't sell them. So, meaning, I mean, a select, the select animal is a high-quality animal. Yes. And I was lucky because this was their second auction of 2019. The first one was when a vast majority of our stuff went. Right. All sold really, really well. Got got pretty good prices. You know, the prices are on on, on a bit of a rebound. And, and then uh, after the second one, they sent out checks and everything, and then they started having problems. And people's checks started bouncing. Ours bounced. And yeah. then, well, then they were going to take care of it. They would uh, let them know what your um, your bank charges were and everything. They yeah. would take care of all that. And then eventually they got forced into uh, uh, creditor protection. And it looks like now, don't quote me because I may not have this right. There's been so much communication all over out there. But it looks like CIBC, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, is their banker. And, of course, they are the first. They would hold first position on yes. on any income. And so I don't know what that's going to mean to my fur that's there or to the the, the check that's bounced. I'm... I'm f- Probably if I bet on it being lost, that's a good way to think about it. Well, for sure the check will be, um, I'm thinking. Yes, um, resident banker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once you're in receivership, protected creditors, um, secured creditors are paid first, and everybody else is paid last, if at all. Um, and sometimes it's a, a, a fraction of what you're owed. Now, the one thing that we don't know about is the status of the fur that was held on consignment, because that is our fur. Yeah, it's on consignment, but there's a weird thing that's going on here. The, one of the first debtors that has jumped, that has stepped in here is Saga Furs. Now, I'm, I'm not sure of the proper terminology. Does it mean they're the receiver or, or receiver or whatever it is? But Saga Furs was a company that uh, they, are, they are fur ranchers. And a very large international fur rancher. They got in, Nafa got in bed with them, and they bought into Saga, and Saga bought into them, or something like that. I'm not sure. Anyway, there, there is a business relationship there because at one one time, uh, Nafa sold like a hundred million ranched mink in, in one year. Hmm. You know, they, and it became it became the whole focus of uh, of of the auction and of the company and everything else was the was the ranched fur and and. 
I may not be popular with my thoughts on that because I don't think that that's a good thing for our industry. Um, and, and well, I'm, Wild I, first seemed to take a back seat it did because to a lot of what was going on in the auction. You business. had that burgeoning mi- middle class going on in, in Asia and China and that, and, mm-hmm. and fur was a very big deal for them. But, of course, the only thing that they could get in the numbers that they wanted was mink, yeah. right? And, and in reality, when it comes to building a fur coat, uh, for the main part of the coat, it might take 40 mink. Well, I can take 40 mink out of the same lot out of the same fur shed and they will all match. Whereas it might, they might have to separate through, through several hundred of my wild mink to come up with the forty to make right. that match enough to make that coat. So I can see the the economics of that, the the scale, right? But the whole problem was then they really quit promoting in in North America, or at least that I could see. Yeah. They they ended up going to Asia, and they had all of these these. Um, design and technical schools on how to work with fur and all that kind of stuff. And they just totally abandoned North America. And and then you have a company like Canada Goose, which, which is just taking the world by storm. Yeah. And that's got wild fur on it. Yeah. You know, so I had discussions with, with, with fellas there and, and expressed my feeling and they, they, they didn't feel it was that way. Um, we agreed to disagree. Okay. Yeah. But what happened, what ended, actually ended up happening, happening it was after... The the big flood of fur going from here into China had to do with corruption. It was being smuggled in and it wasn't being taken in yeah. in a correct way. They were not paying customs and duties and that on it the way it was yeah. supposed to be. So and a that, lot of those people that were importing um, ended up in jail. Absolutely. They're in jail yeah. and they'll never see the light of day again. And because you <laughs> well, over there, you might cheat on your taxes here, but you don't in a communist country. <laughs> well, yeah, who knows what the real real story behind everything is? But the bottom line is that NAFA is no longer in business. And um, well, what happened though? I mean, because they had all of that fur, all of that ranch fur, and it's like any other auction house, whether it's auctioning equipment or whatever, they they have uh, a reserve bid, mm-hmm. and so they had guaranteed all of these. Uh, you know, SAGA furs, they had guaranteed them a reserve bid and everything, and it just wasn't happening mm-hmm. because the bottom fell out of the market in China mm-hmm. and it's gone. And now they can't get the, they can't get it up to say, say the reserve bid was $20 on a female mink. Well, now they can't come anywhere near that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's pushing around $12. So they don't sell it, <clears throat> but they still had to pay that $20 reserve to, yeah. to SAGA furs. Cause it's the same thing. If I take my, a trailer or a truck into Ritchie Brothers, you know, and they guarantee me X dollars. And they don't get it. They still have to pay out the guarantee. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's what actually took uh, took NAFA down was that they couldn't cover those reserves for, for the ranch, uh, the ranchers. So a lot of people now are really uh, upset. They're concerned. They're worried about where it's going and what, what's going to happen to the fur market. And I understand that. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a big change. They've been... They have been the face of, of first fur auctions for forever. Yeah. But we still have another very old and well-established uh, yeah. auction house. which fur is harvesters. Which is fur harvesters. And I, I was just reading through uh, a uh, media blast that they sent out in their market forecast. Things are looking much better. Um, you know, the, the, the things are picking up. Once again, of course, top quality is going to go for the most. Uh, and, uh, you know, like... And if that you, shouldn't surprise anybody. No. Uh, uh, the only place where where the the uh, the demand will will carry down through the the rankings and that will be coyotes, you know, because because there is a huge such a huge demand for coyotes, yeah, so still. you can still you know even a lesser quality coyote you still get some bucks for. Yeah. Um, and the better quality ones are going to go go yes. very high. Yeah. Uh, things like lynx cat are doing really well. Mm-hmm. Large clear lynx are doing good. What's a clear lynx? Well, that's where they later in the season they have no white, uh, no brown on their belly whatsoever. It's very oh, white, okay, okay. And which makes it look a lot like the bobcat, which the right. bobcat or lynx cat is is uh, uh, is the, the most desirable when it came, comes mm-hmm. to making coats. And it's that belly is what it's all about. Beaver, if you're going to uh, do beaver, do it in the wintertime. The high quality beaver uh, are going for felting, and yeah, it's actually and that has made a real comeback. It has, but here's the deal, is that <laughs> even though they grade it, whether it's a, a, a fall beaver, you know, like a blue or a, or a white, a right. winter, heavy, heavy winter, they buy it by the pound. 
Yeah. Okay, so... So your heavy winter beavers yeah. are going to be worth more because they're heavier. <laughs> exactly. They've got, they've got a lot more the, for that felting, right? So yeah. it's not even so much as the, um, the quality of fleshing or anything that you've done. It's, it's, it's that whether or not it's a heavy winter or not. And they, that's strictly... They're going to look at... They're going to flip it over and they're going to look at it. And the whiter that that, uh, that leather can be, the, then it's going to go into, that, into the winter. Into it's the a, heavier... It, yeah pile so or the other thing that you can do and anyone that's watched our show the last show of season five which you can find on youtube now if you don't uh, if you're not connected on any other channel um we did we took 21 beaver to um and had them had them all tanned and sheared and then we took them to a furrier friend of ours in red deer alberta called sis and furs and they made a blanket for us yeah. out of 20 of those beaver yeah and it is one of the most luxurious things i've Isn't ever it? ever encountered it uh it's spectacular so you know there's something else that you can do either you know to sell it yourself or or just to enjoy your own fur that i think a lot of a lot of trappers are actually doing that now and and looking at the beauty of what what they can keep and and do for themselves oh, unbelievable and i got to say this and and you'll agree with me after you turn red <laughs> oh good that, that beaver blanket is the sexiest thing ever been on that bed other than you <laughs> <laughs> there you go red <laughs> sometimes it's better to say nothing <laughs> oh i had to i had to no it is it is Fabulous. I can't believe how nice that is. Yeah. It's remarkable. And I think they still have one of our skins, and I'm hoping that it might be a pillow one day. Yeah. I heard you're going to have them turn a zebra into his purse. Mm-hmm. Yes, I am. We When we were in Africa last year, well, you get turned on to the idea of what you can do with skins or pelts or, or whatever. And it's amazing what is out there. And if you think about um, how you can turn that into something that's a usable item so i i shot a very large zebra stallion when we were in africa this year in june and just a beautiful hide on him uh, regardless of whether or not they they're with scars or not that gives character in my opinion um yeah he's got lots of scars <laughs> <laughs> Good thing she's in disguise, guys. <laughs> and lots of character. So uh, somebody said her, you know, because I have a, a beautiful uh, pedestal uh, shoulder mount that I that I had my very first zebra done from. Are you going to make a rug out of this one, Sandy? They said, and I said, actually, no. I'm going to have the the skin tanned um, so that I I can have a purse made out of it and then maybe some pillows yeah. um, for either our bed or out here on the couch or whatever. But just something that's, you know, artistic and, and it's a little different. You're a lady of eclectic tastes. I'm glad that I, I fit your definition of eclectic. <laughs> Probably the nicest thing anybody ever said about me. <laughs> He's eclectic. <laughs> That you're eclectic. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> anyway, back to, we wandered down that, that rabbit hole. Back to uh, NAFA and what's happened to the fur trade. Uh, I think we're actually going to see good uh, prices this year. For and wild I, fur. Yes, for wild fur. Because NAFA, uh, not NAFA, um, fur harvesters, that's yeah. all they do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they they uh, have in the past gone to Helsinki in Finland and had an auction there that involved some ranched fur. But this the, the, there are two auctions this year. The first one is um, in March 28th, and the last receiving date for it is June 19th. They are um, all going to be wild fur. Okay. And if you don't have an account with them, go look them up for harvesters. Uh, uh, on the internet, uh, one of the, the the terrible things that happened with uh, NAFA going under was a lot of really, you know, a lot of far, uh, uh, ranchers got hurt, but a lot of friends and and, yeah. and uh, employees, and one of them was was Mary. Yes, Mary Schellenberg um, has worked for NAFA for a very long time, but the really good news for Mary and for all of us who ship 
or will ship through um, uh, for harvesters is that is that uh, Mary is going to be working for them or is already working for them. Yes, for harvesters bought the building that um, Mary ran. Uh, the building in, in Winnipeg and did all, yeah. of the, all the Western fur for NAFA. If you ever had a problem with NAFA and you phoned it uh, up and you spoke to a, to an angel in Winnipeg, you were talking to Mary. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant very, angel too. She had a, always had the answers. Very <laughs> lucky to have her on our side in all of this and that, um, that she's found a new home after all of this, because even as, as trappers and, and business people shipping fur and, and so on, all of, all of those people who got hurt, there were others that got hurt too, and one of them was Mary. Yeah. There is going to be uh, a big flux. Anytime that you pull something that giant out of, uh, uh, out of an economy, a market, or anything else, it leaves a big hole, and everything rushes into, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And all of a sudden, there is, the, uh, how many different fur buyers have popped up this year? Yeah. You know, like Lots Alfred's, of- Alfred's is, is going to be buying fur. If you if you want, you can go there and uh, sell fur directly to Halfords. Uh, I think they're. I forget. You look on their website uh, whether it's every day during during the during the week. But uh, Steve will be, will be there buying fur. He'll buy it from directly. Cut you a check. Yep. And there's and there are still those that will continue to buy fur that have always bought fur because yes. we've got friends and uh, and others that we know of that have been in this area and will buy fur. Brian Finlinson. Yeah. And uh, what's the other fella? Taves? The fella who does the, uh, always has the fur at the rendezvous. Oh, yes. I can't remember. Anyway, um, his name is on the tip of my tongue and I yeah. can't think of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Gordy Clausen also has bought fur. I'm yeah. not sure I, whether I don't he's know doing whether Gordy it. is or not. I yeah. know he is, he will be a shipper for, yeah. for uh, fur harvesters. Uh, a lot of the places that were where you used to take your fur to 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 ship to NAFA, well, you'll now be able to ship to to fur harvesters. Um, but contact fur harvesters yeah. themselves if you have any question about, you know, um, fur buyers in your area or fur depots in your area, wherever. I mean, there's lots of them, and and we could go on for days about it. But I think it's really important that you that you contact fur harvesters directly. I think I think the auctions this year for fur harvesters are going to go well. Yeah. And I think part of it's going to be because there's going to be a lot of people that's going to just hold their cards close to their vest and not send fur. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to have, rather than the portion of the fur buyers in the world that used to come to them, Mm -hmm. and some of them only went to NAFA, now you're going to have all of them have to go to to fur harvesters. And I think there's going to be a much higher demand at those auctions than than they've ever seen before. And I don't think they're going to have the the, the fur that they they had just because people are not sure. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there is that uncertainty out there, but there's also um, not going to be as much of the ranched that's going to be there either, no, there's right? There's none, none going to be at, at fur harvesters. Right. That's, that's not, a, not an issue. But just ranched fur overall in terms of available for sale otherwise? Yeah, so. like Saga is, Saga furs that took over, it seems like they have taken over um, the wild fur that's, or all the fur that's on consignment. And they will sell it off, and then I guess they'll pay themselves first. And I, I don't know how. I'm not that... sure how that's going to go. I think there's a lot of legal wrangling still going on yeah. with that because I'm not sure how how they could sell everything that's there on consignment and claim the first checks for themselves when the consigned items don't belong to them. No, that's that, that's exa- exactly it, and and that would make me pretty angry. And I'm a pretty easygoing guy because that's that's not right. There's a lot of folks that have a lot of fur there. Yeah. And I mean, what we've got there will will neither break me nor destroy me, but it still angers me that that a fur rancher would be getting the money for. Well, it. we don't know that, so that's yeah. just well. No, you're, you're right. We determined. don't. We don't know. We don't know. But uh, they are going to go ahead and have an auction. I know they're having an auction, and that auction will Saga Furs will have an auction, and it will be mostly, predominantly the, the uh, ranch stuff, and that's because. Since the crash of the ranch market that happened when the Chinese people went to jail and all that, they we went from having a hundred million uh, mink pelts being sold a year. Now we're down to to twenty or less million, mm-hmm. and everybody's pelting out. They, you can't keep those animals on the shelf. Mm-hmm. They they live on average four years, mm-hmm. and they have to be pelted out at that point. And so 
the people are pelting out and they're and they're they're, they're selling out, and so that that's going to bring some balance back into the market, right? And yeah. more demand, I believe. I think so too, but it uh, at the end of the day, it remains to be seen what the fallout's going to be from all of this. But um, we're quite optimistic. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like anything else. When when one person disappears, you know, one big player disappears. Like there'll be thirty little guys run in, and and it'll yeah. find balance as, as well. Yeah. You know, uh, it's 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 amazing how 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 it works. And I everybody was having a fit because you know it was the end of of, of fur and fur sales. It's no, not even close. No, not even close. The guys no. at fur harvesters, you know, uh, I've, I've I know Mark Downey, the uh, owner, president, chairman, whatever. Mark is, he, uh, <laughs> he'll be Probably happy to hear that. Probably should have looked yeah. that up. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to him so many times and shook his head. And, I mean, he's a great guy, you know, and, and uh, he's, he's always done a good job for, for the wild fur guys. They have that McKenzie Valley stamp, yes, you know, which is for the, the uh, fellas to the north. Uh, it is a stamp that indicates that that's where the fur came from. And it's in great, that, that fur is always in great demand uh, with the high quality buyers. I mean, they've, they've done and a lot. And it is because it is high quality fur. And that's Absolutely. one of the things that even though, you know, anybody that knows anything about trapping and and weather and climate and all of that that goes on, where we are in the north and where our trap line is, those guys are even further north. But yep. that's where you get the heaviest fur from. Yep. And and prime is, is prime, but heavy is different than prime. Yep. Prime has to do with daylight, yep. and it's how thick the leather is. As they get less and less daylight, the leather gets thicker and thicker, mm-hmm. okay? So there's a thicker coating over the roots of the hairs, and that's why you don't see the blue anymore. Correct. The blue is the roots of the hair. But full and heavy comes from how cold it gets. Correct. Okay? So you, you can definitely, you can get animals that get prime, you know, far, far south from us, but they'll never get full or heavy. Correct. Because they just don't get cold enough. And that's why the coyotes in this area, western coyotes are are uh, one of the sought after furs as well, right? I know, and, and the weather finally turned here. I, I I know looking at the chest here, I'm starting to get full and heavy. <laughs> the pelt's getting pretty good there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's do a commercial. <laughs> oh, let's do a commercial. This is it, it's uh says our podcast is doing so good. Old Smokes has decided to come on and sponsoring our podcast, Old Smokes Coffee. So that's O-L-E. And if you go to oldsmokescoffee.com, O-L-E smokescoffee.com, and you can use our uh, promo code. Our promo code. We have a promo code. Get you 10% off of your online order. All you use is the is the promo code Trapping Inc. One word, Trapping Inc. So Very that's sp- I-N-C, not I-N-K. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't think that would be an issue, would you? No, but what? yeah. I, I tell people. Ink is short for incorporated. Yeah. So that's I thought everybody, why. I thought every, guys are my witness. I thought everybody knew that. Well. But we get stuff sent here, and checks, and thankfully nobody at the bank ever looks, but they, they'll have Trappers Inc. So Trappers and then I-N-K. I-N-K. And we're trapping ink. <laughs> It's okay. It, the checks still cash. Oh, yeah, they cash. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it has been a wonderful time to be back here with you guys, catching up a little bit more. And things are really happening. We're hoping to get more of these uh, out in, the, in a big hurry. It's been a pleasure, my doll. Always a pleasure. Sometimes a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being with us. And hopefully we see you guys down the line. 